okay. By the way, no offense at all if you're like, I'm done, I'm leaving, I love you, have a great evening. Okay, I'm serious, I'm not even joking. So can you, can you come forward? I just, uh, Manisha, can you come forward? Is that okay? Can you come? And um, I don't, I just want to make room quickly you know, just a short, quick thing, but I uh, I just want to honor these guys, you know. Um, obviously, you guys know them, some of you know them because you've known them for years, but uh, I've been around a few places, and it's rare to find people that will lay things down when it's not building their own empire, you know. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not the Tara Manisha Ministries, you know? It's not, you know, it's not. And um, so I just want to honor you. I want to honor you both. It's been amazing getting to know you for two weeks and seeing how you live, who you are, and what you're doing in the city. I know this is just the beginning. And, um, and I'm pretty sure there's people in here that also carry that same honor for you. Would you agree? Yeah. Some of you? Yeah, yeah. So, that could have probably been done a lot better than what I just did. <laughs> Maybe I'll get the professionals to do it later when we're wrapping up. Um, oh, we started at the beginning. Okay, so if you've been here, we have been through all of this. Catch whatever you can as fast as possible. Oh, 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 oh. Nearly there. Okay, so just a quick recap. So, <clears throat> yesterday we talked about how everyone is necessary. Every one of you is necessary in what God is doing on the planet. Uh, and we talked about how king, the kingdom expansion cannot happen without you playing your part. All right? So part of my purpose, my mission is to mobilize people into their purpose. And then we talked about purposes, identity, assignment, maturity. We talked about that day before yesterday, so you might want to watch the replay of that one. And then, yesterday we talked about how the highest calling anybody has is that of being son. You may function as a prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, all that kind of stuff, but the highest calling you have is that of being son. And a son is just Papa's kid who just didn't earn that position, but received it. Are you with me? So today, we're going to go into being mobilized, right? That's the goal of the session, is that you would get some next steps to be mobilized in what God is calling you to do, okay? So what I'm going to do is get you to move your seat and sit next to someone you don't know, because you're going to need a buddy for the next half an hour, okay? But you got 60 seconds, so you got to move. Here we go. Three, two, one. Go, 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 go. Find your buddy. Find your buddy. Someone you don't know. Someone you don't know, find your buddy, or someone you know the least, okay? Someone you don't know, or someone you know the least, they're your buddy. Don't go far away, you got to stay close, stay close. Awesome. Stay closer, you want to come closer, guys, you want to come closer, yeah, great, great. You want to come closer. So you want your buddy, you want to introduce yourself to your buddy. Alright, your names, if you already know each other that well, this might not be that much fun. But introduce yourselves, and then you want to tell your buddy one thing that's funny about you. One thing that's funny about you, okay? One thing that is funny about you. Go, 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 go. Anybody want to share the funny thing they heard? <laughs> oh, you're super cool? Okay. What? Oh, wow. Craig David over there. Anyone want to share the funny thing? Anyone? He cracks a lot of personal jokes, okay? Anyone else? Oh, you guys are all well behaved? Nothing funny? Okay. So, when we talk about being mobilized, we talk about moving, 
You know, um, over the last two days I've talked to you a lot about how we have been trained to learn, but we've not been trained to do. We've had a lot of teaching, we have a lot of knowledge, we have, we have very less application, very less uh, actual movement, you know. Most churches, 10% of people do all the work. That is not God's design. There's a problem there. And the problem is the way we do things. That's one of the reasons what we're doing here needs to happen, where there's interaction the whole way, right? A lot of Greek learning was one man stands, he has a pulpit, and he just tells you things, but Hebraic learning was very back and forth. Are you with me? So some of you have just been trained to sit and listen and you tune out and maybe you think about Burger King and things you're going to eat later and then you come back in the room and then you're gone and you come back. Uh, but So mobilizing requires you to be engaged. And so as we do this, I am expecting you to engage each other. Is that cool? Yes? Yeah. Awake? Are we awake? Yeah. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes! Okay. Because I'm not performing here for you. I'm serious. Like a lot of cheer stuff happens where it's like a zoo, you know? If someone performs with you, I'm not performing here for you. I'm coming here to tell you, and I, I flew, it was a 30, 34 hour journey for me to get here. It's a 16 hour flight tomorrow for me to go back. I'm here to tell you, God is waiting on you to do something. Yeah. Right? Not for anybody else. That's why you're on the planet. So I'm not performing here for you. I'm expecting us all to move to a new realm in the next half an hour. Are you with me? Okay, so performance culture, you end up working for something. You, you try and earn rewards. You strive. It's driven by external rewards. When you have performance culture, you're an easy target because the enemy can stop you in multiple ways. When you have performance culture, you're doing all kinds of dealing all the time. But what we're moving into is understanding maturity. Can you say maturity? Maturity. Anybody remember the definition of maturity? Anyone? Being just like your father in heaven, right? A lot of times we think maturity is your ability, maturity is the size of your ministry. But in reality, Romans 8.29, you were predestined to be conformed to the image and the likeness of His Son. How much are you like Jesus? How much are you like our Father? That's true maturity, right? And so when you are moving from maturity, so you can almost look at these two performance and maturity as your gas tank. This is the fuel for your life. When performance is your fuel, that is how you drive. But when maturity is your fuel, you don't work for God, you work with God. You don't earn from Him, you inherit as a son. You don't strive and try and make it happen, you race and allow it to show up. You're not driven by the external, because now you know that your internal atmosphere changes everything externally. Are you with me? Where does the kingdom of God reside? In you, internally, not on the outside. Now, if you've been trained in some Pentecostal cultures, you think God's only there when you can feel Him on the outside. But that's not biblical. In reality, He's there on the inside all the time. Are you with me? When you are moving by maturity, you're a hard target. Because you're in Him and He's in you and you know that reality. So the enemy is not easily, um, it's not easy for the enemy to grab you. The hardest thing you will face if you're going to walk the journey of maturity is dealing with your own heart. Because every situation you will ever face is flowing out of your heart, right? The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows every issue of your life. Are we good? Okay. So the problem is you've been pre patterned You've been pre-patterned to perform. From when you're a kid, from when you're a little kid, uh, as uh, parents get excited as you perform, as you do things. Then you go to school, and when you go to school, you get trained to perform. You're constantly hearing things like, oh, why can't you do this better? Why can't you do things like your cousin or your brother or your uncle? You're constantly trained to perform. And so, to walk in maturity, you must be willing to renew, rewire the pattern. Are you with me? And so, maturity, being just like Jesus. 
And it's pretty amazing that Jesus keeps making comments like this. I only do what I see my Father doing. Apart from Him, I can do nothing. All authority has been given to me. I didn't earn it. I didn't fight for it. I didn't go find it. It was just given to me. Are you with me? So I'm just setting a, a little foundation here for us as we go deeper. So an important thing to understand is a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. John 3.27, right? This scripture is massive because what this is saying is everything in your life that is going on or not going on, there is an issue of your ability to receive from heaven. Are you with me? Do you know that we really struggle to receive? We love to earn. Why do you think we love to earn? Go yell it out, yeah. Why? We like to perform, yeah. Why else do we like to earn? Recognition, yeah. Why else do we like to earn things? It's what we've been taught, yeah. What else? Why do we like to earn something? Why do we like to be able to say, I did that? Right. Yeah, God did it, but I did it and God did it. Right. Pride, yeah. What else? Take one more answer. Personal gratification. So our ego gets a little stroking. And it's really hard because God's like, I want to give this to you. And we're like, no, no, don't give it to me. I'll earn it. Are you, are you with me? And then and we try and taint his pure love, even with 5% of trying to earn it, it ruins the whole thing. Can you imagine if I come to you with a $50,000 gem, okay, a jewel, a diamond, and I want to give it to you. And I'm like, hey, uh, Johnny, let me give this to you. This is my expression of my love for you. This is my gift. And Johnny takes it. He's like, wow, this is amazing. I love it. Mm, I love it, man. But I've got to give you something. Let me give you my shoes. <laughs> You know, and he takes his shoes off and he wants to give me his shoes. Is that still a gift that I gave him? The minute he wants to give me shoes for it, he has now stopped it from being a gift. And it is so hard for an ego to understand that because we've been patterned to earn it. Are you with me? No? Yes? And depending on your culture, especially if you have Indian culture, right, or Indian schooling that was really drilled in. So all the things in the kingdom that are going to come through maturity are coming as a gift. And if you are patterned to perform, to earn, to deserve all the things He wants to give you, you will pause. You will put to the side. Because you are going, I don't deserve it yet. Are you with me? This is why someone who is forgiven much knows that they love much. Because they did nothing for it. And they suddenly just see, man, I didn't even earn this. Look at this love. Wow. And that just sets a pattern for them to be able to receive. Are you guys okay? All right. So everything that you have and don't have is a conversation you need to have with your source. With your source. Now, when you're in performance culture, who is the source? Who's, who's the source? You are the source. When you're in performance culture, you are the source. Because whether it happens or not depends on your performance. When you're in maturity culture, who is the source? Father, right? God, Father, Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit. Boom. So I want you to turn to your partner right now. Okay? We're going to do a two-minute exercise. And I want you to have a conversation around an area in your life that you have been waiting for something to shift. Or you wish it would be different, but it hasn't been. And I want you to see in your conversation, the reason conversation is good is because it helps you bring out whatever's on the inside, right? So we're going to have a conversation with our partner about an area in our life that maybe we have been performing, striving for, trying to earn and not allowing God to just give, not allowing ourselves to just receive. Are you with me? Okay, go for it. Two minutes.
One more minute. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Okay. Time. Time. All right. So, one of the reasons that we do this like this. So back in New Zealand, uh, this is how we do our gatherings. We do our gatherings by, everybody comes, we break into groups, groups of four, usually male, female, old, young, and then we break open scripture and have conversation. And when you're having a discussion, there's limited time. One of the reasons there's limited time is because it starts training us on being succinct, only saying what we mean, saying what we really want to say, instead of going all around the bush, right? When we first start this, usually you'll find that, oh, only one of us has spoken. The other one hasn't. And we don't understand that there is, we can't be effective in the kingdom when we are not aware of what's going on. Are you with me? So tonight, as we do this, there's a lot of training that's happening indirectly with you. Okay? So, is there anybody that wants to share something that came up? We'll take two shares. gentleman right here. He's looking for an encounter. There have been questions that he has asked and he knows that personal encounter more important than God. Yeah, that's, that's the conversation. Cool, very cool. All right, everything begins with an encounter. Anyone else? Um, so me, I spoke, I'm going to talk about myself. So I just said, one of the places I know I need this conversation to stop her from me is at my work. Because I've been struggling and I feel like she doesn't see me, I do so much work and, I, and a few weeks ago God said, promotion comes from me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can hold on to that, we'll pass it on. Awesome. Yeah, perform, uh, is that on? <laughs> promotion comes from the Lord, yeah. We're finding, we're finding our flow right now, okay, give another couple of minutes, we'll have our flow. So, we're going to go into a little bit about what God, how do I say this? How God is going to, how God is going to use us in the places that He's put us. A lot of times we think the way that a city is going to change is we're going to have a revival meeting, someone's going to sing, it's going to be anointed, and definitely is, but then everyone's going to come into the building pack the building, and that's going to be the new lifestyle. And we don't understand that revival must lead to reformation. Only then will there be transformation in a city. It doesn't matter how amazing your encounter is in here, if it doesn't translate to something different out there. Are you with me? And the difference between what happens in here and what you do out there is how you think. It's how you process. And so, I want to go into a few things that Jesus talks about, about you. Right, Charles at the beginning, he talked about how uh, we are the salt of the earth. And he talked about how salt is in invisible. It's like this influence that's happening from an unseen place. But it's very important to know that there's a difference between describing salt and demonstrating salt. Describing salt is where you know about the kingdom, or you know about God, or you know about uh, the salvation, or you know about heaven. But there are a lot of people who can describe something that they've never practiced demonstrating. Are you with me? So right now, Papa Amos is teaching you how to demonstrate an element of heaven, not just describe it. Do you know that Jesus did less describing, more demonstrating, but because He demonstrated, they wanted Him to describe it. Because He walked a certain way, they wanted Him to talk about it. They all followed Him, not because of His talk. It was the walk that caused the curiosity. And so there is a way that God is calling us to operate, to be in the world, but not of the world. 
He's calling us to do that because 95% of people, believers, are not called to this building calling. So your job, your business, the places of influence He's given you are requiring you to know how to allow heaven to fill you and flow through you. So, just quickly with your partner, 60 seconds each, right? I want you to be honest and talk about whether you are one that describes the salt or demonstrates it. Whether you are one that describes the salt, describes the things of the kingdom, or you are one that demonstrates it. Are you with me? 60 seconds. Go for it. Each. 60 seconds each. And if you are one that only describes it, maybe you want to talk about your struggle with demonstrating it. What is your challenge with demonstrating the kingdom, right? Make sure your partner also speaks. You've got 60 more seconds. Are you a describer or a demonstrator? What is your struggle with demonstrating? Five seconds. Okay, time. Does anybody want to share? We'll take two shares. Two shares from your conversation. We'll take two shares. Anybody? There's one here. Yeah, pass the mic. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I was talking to Sanjay. He's more of a demonstration person. He his dad was sick and he actually went boldly and he prayed for the doctor who was going to operate his, his dad. Okay. And for me, I was more of a descriptive, you know, kingdom person. I know that God heals, but I don't have the boldness to go and pray for a person who's sick. Okay. Great. All right, this, uh, so, normally we don't make room for this kind of conversation, but we should be able to say, I would love to go pray for someone, but I have no boldness. Are you with me? If I can't say that in my family, then where can I say that? If I have to pretend like I'm so perfect with you, who's my family? What hope do I have? Alright? So the Bible says even the apostles prayed for boldness. They prayed for courage. They asked others to pray for them. So now, if I'm you, my next step is, God, I don't have boldness, but I will give you full permission to father me into boldness. To fill me with your courage. Are you with me? So this is great. Anyone else want to share? We'll take one more. One more. If your heart's beating fast, that's you. That's you. Come on. 
Family, I'm throwing you the ball. Someone's got to catch it. Yeah, go for it. Catherine and myself both, uh, we spoke about demonstrator um, because she has a lot of love for people, which that's her, the way she is. So she demonstrates more than uh, describing it. And uh, I think we both, because of we are the same, pretty same age, uh, our actions speak louder than words. Mm. Um, for me, I'm more of a demonstrator because when I speak, I might not say the right thing at the right time. So I demonstrate more in quietness. So, so I say that um, actions speak louder than words again. Mm. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to go a little deeper here. Why? I don't know what it's like here, but in New Zealand, the church does not have the respect of the people. In New Zealand, the church as a whole, Christianity, does not have the respect of the people. Because a lot of them have been through the system, chewed up and spat out. So one of the things is that as, as a body of Christ, we don't have influence. We don't have a say in many things. Because we've done a lot of describing and not enough demonstrating. Are you with me? How many of you have experienced what I'm saying to you? There's a lot of talking about stuff. Don't really see it. Most churches are the places people go, I see the most hypocrites there. Because they say something, they call me church family, no one wants to come to my house. Right? I know here the culture is a little different, so the issues are going to be a little different. But in New Zealand, it's very rare for people to go to each other's house and actually be family. You know, you're my church family, which means I have a real family, you're kind of the side family. When it fits me, you're family. But when it doesn't, you're not. Do you understand that that word church family needs to die? There is no church family. Either it's family or it's not. You know? So when we look at this word influence, influence is the ability that I have to cause change in something else or someone else. Influence is my ability to cause change in something else or someone else. Now usually in church settings, we give a little bit of influence to people with titles. We give a little bit of influence to people that maybe are, are famous or maybe that they see miracles. We just give a little bit of influence there. But most people don't have influence in one another's lives. So we're going to go into this subject of influence. Kingdom influence is to have the effect that our king designs, right? And so every place that you touch, including your city and nations you go to and your workplace, there is an effect that your king is desiring to have. Are you with me? In Christianity, you have a lot of opinions and you can put God wherever you want. In the kingdom, he's the king and it's not a democracy. So suddenly, what he says goes. Are you with me? A lot of people say, I love God, I love God. But then Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So that's one of the ways you know whether someone loves God. They keep the commandments. And so when we, when we come into, all my slides have been uh, messed up a little bit. But anyway, so we're going to look at this subject of uh, influence, right? And the influence that the king desires to have through you. Our king desires to have through you. So a couple of things about influence. Influence cannot be imposed. It cannot be forced onto someone. As a coach, there's many times that I'll speak to someone and maybe I'm counseling like a marriage situation. And the wife will say, I say the same thing you say, but he doesn't listen to me. Or the husband will say, I say the same thing, but they don't listen to me. Right? Or times in my family where my sister will come and say, you should tell her that. Because when I say it, she doesn't listen. And so then my question is, how come she doesn't listen? And this is the reason that people don't listen in that case is because there was no influence. Are you with me? A lot of times we try and have an effect somewhere where we haven't been given that permission. Influence cannot be taken. It must be given. Are you with me? So we're going to have this conversation with each other. And I want you, 60 seconds again each, to share about where you think God has given you influence. Influence. Where has God given you influence? Okay? Go for it.
Okay, make sure your partner gets time to it. 60 seconds. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. Okay, time. All right, can we get a couple of people sharing? Two new people sharing? Yeah. Can you pass on the mic, please, Ajo? Can you pass on the mic? Can you pass on the mic? Yes, yeah, so David here is an influencer in, 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 in gathering people. I think he's noticed from childhood if the his parents have to go, go bring your friends, call your friends. He call the neighbors, he call people from all over the place. Wow. And he's, he feels that he's going to use that in the kingdom. Okay, great. Influence to gather people. Awesome. Anyone else? Come on. Someone else who hasn't shared. Imagine if we were really family, I'd have to keep you from sharing. Because you'd all be screaming. what God has already given you. A lot of times we're praying for things and God's like, I gave this to you five years ago. I'm still waiting for you to use it. You know, it's not an accident that you have this influence. So we talk a lot about purpose, purpose, purpose. Now, the fact that she has influence with this certain group of people is a clue to the purpose that she's come with. The fact that she can sing and it's having an effect is a clue to her purpose. The fact that he can gather people is a clue to his purpose. Are you with me? In these conversations, a lot of things are happening in your mindset and being able to draw out of your heart. So one of the things that Jesus says is you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. What do you think that means? Come on, family. Okay, can you pass on the mic? Yeah. Uh, showing an example. Showing an example. Yeah, great. What else? And you can yell out. You don't need the mic. You yell out. What is the light of the world? What do you think? It should be a safe space. A safe space? Okay. Okay. But why light? Because there's darkness. You're shining. You're called to shine. Influence. To be welcome to everybody. So you're open to everybody. Yeah. What else? What is it? Yeah, yeah. To bring you, but what is that? What, why why did he use the word light? Show the way? Wow, yeah. Shed light? Direction? What else? To be seen. To be seen? What else? So when people see you, they see him. Okay? Now we go to the last part there. Light of the world. Why of the world? What do you think? The world has darkness. Okay, what else? Any other thoughts? Why light of the world? Hope? Nice, what else? You guys gonna be louder. Truth and purpose. Purpose, yeah. We'll take two more. Why of the world? The world needs it. And we have the good news. Okay, great. So it's interesting how a lot of our evangelism techniques have been tugboats 
We've been trained to be tugboats. Go out in there and grab someone and bring them in. You do, come on. You know, and a lot of our thinking has been like that when really you are the light of the world. And so I want to challenge you today asking you how much do you think could you become like a lighthouse? Do you understand what a lighthouse does? What does a lighthouse do? Shines, gives direction, warns, shows lights to other people, yeah? But think about a lighthouse, okay? Does, does a lighthouse move much? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. The light moves, but the house is stationary, so it's not running out to convince any ship that you should come here. How much of evangelism has become salesmanship? Are you with me? Trying to go out there to convince someone to come to the shore that I think you should be at. When really a lighthouse is just shining and ships that are lost find their way home. Are you with me? You are the light of the world, not a, not a tugboat. And so actually a lot of things will start happening when you just learn to shine in what He has given you. As opposed to trying to produce to then feel like you have something. Are you with me? So this means that if you can sing, should you sing more? Yeah. If you can gather people, should you gather people more? If you have influence in your school, should you use it? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to go into a few parables quickly. I'm going to need a Bible reader. Okay. Who will be the Bible reader? Tough crowd. Okay, we got a Bible reader here. Cool. Can someone pass her the mic? We can just pass it through to her. And I'm going to get you to read Matthew 13, 44. So all of you probably want to open this up, okay? This is going to help you. Matthew 13, 44. You want to preferably get ESV, English Standard Version, or NASB, New American Standard Version. Um, yeah. You want to get one of those two, preferably. Or New King James. Okay, yeah, go for it when you're ready. Just that verse. Is that mic on? Is it off? Did you turn it off? Yeah, yeah, it was off. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay, we're going to unpack this verse. Alright, because we're going back to Kingdom 101. Okay. So the Kingdom of God is like what? A treasure. What comes to your mind when you hear treasure? Come on, throw me answers. We've got to move quicker. Diamonds, gold, precious. Mighty? No, we are not yet hidden. What comes to your mind when you hear treasure? Okay, I understand what you're trying to say now. Yeah, okay, treasure is hidden. Alright. What comes to your mind? Valuable. Precious, yeah. Wealth. Take two more. What comes to your mind when you hear treasure? Secrets. Adventure. Yeah. What did you say? Knowledge. Okay. So the kingdom of God is like treasure. What's next? Where is it? Treasure hidden in a field. What does that say to you? You have to find it. You need to dig. Go be louder, guys. You have to search. You need to sow some seeds. Treasure hidden in a field. You have to put effort. Work for it. What else? Treasure hidden in a field. What comes to your mind when you hear that? You have to be ready to give up so much. Ooh, okay, you have to be ready to give up so much. We're jumping ahead a little bit here. Harvest. Harvest. See, here is the problem, right? We are now starting to read these simple words through our amazing Christian lens. And what happens when you start putting that lens on is you stop that word from being alive in your life in this moment. These words are alive. They're not just pieces of paper with some ink on them. They're portals into another dimension. It's a living word. It's not dead. So when I come with a preconceived idea of what this is saying, I miss out on daily bread in that moment. Are you with me? So I'm getting you to simplify your interaction with the Word. So when you hear treasure, 
We're not going into Christian mode. What is treasure, right? Some of you probably think of Indiana Jones or Pirates of the Caribbean, right? You go down this path. But then we go hidden in a field. And now we, because we're conditioned, what's the harvest, what's this, what's that, that, we stop it from telling us what it's trying to say. The gospel is so simple that a six-year-old, an eight-year-old can hear it, receive it, and have the fullness of it. Are you with me? If your gospel cannot be received by a six or eight year old, you've turned it into something else. Are you with me? So let's do this again. So treasure hidden in a field. What comes to your mind? Hidden in plain sight. Yes. What else? What comes to your mind? There's no right or wrong answers. The problem is when you put a lens on, you stop it from telling you things. What else? Let's take two more. Hidden in plain sight. You need tools and you need to take it. Okay, so the kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field that a man found. Oh, you got the mic right there. You've got to get used to the mic. I think God's trying to tell you something this season, right? So, here you go. And covered up. So the man found it and he covered it up. What does that say to you? Yeah, he hides it. I'm telling you he hides it. But what is that saying to you? Why is he hiding it? What's going on? The kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field that a man found and covered up. Keeping it to himself. Don't show everybody. What else? What is that telling you, that part? Doesn't want someone else to take it from him, so he really wants it. What else? Greed has kicked in. Interesting. Yeah. What else? We'll take two more answers. No wrong answer here. Doesn't want others to know about it? He wants to buy it first before anyone does? He's protecting it. Okay, so kingdom of God, treasure, hidden in the field, man found, covered up, and then? Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And then in his joy... Kingdom of God, treasure, hidden in the field, man finds, hides that, and then in his joy, so he's happy, sells everything he has and buys it. What does that say to you? He valued the treasure more than whatever he had. Yep. What else? He realized the value of the treasure was worth more than what he had. Yep. What else? I know it's 10.46, I'm making you work, but it's okay, we've got this. The grace is here, alright? 20 more minutes, we're done. He feels there might be more treasures on the field. There's more, okay. What else? Two more, two more answers. Sorry? He found it, so it was his to keep, yeah? What else? Take one more answer. Kingdom of God, treasure hidden in the field, man found, covered up, in his joy, sold everything he had to buy it. Small value more than what he had. More valuable than what he had. Yeah. He could make a profit out of it. One more. One more answer. Anyone? He realized he found what he had been looking for. Awesome. Okay, now we're going to move to the next 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Yep, do you want to finish that and then we'll break it over. Oh, that's the end. Oh, just read 46. Okay. Who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, similar kind of story, but now it's a merchant. So the kingdom of God is like... A merchant. Like a merchant. In search of fine pearls. In search of fine pearls. What does that say to you? He's looking for it, yeah. But the kingdom of God now is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. He knows what he's looking for. It's being exclusive. He's looking for quality. Yeah, he's looking for fine pearls, not just any pearls. Fine pearls. Yeah, what else? He has pearls, but he's looking for something better. Yeah, as a merchant, he would have pearls. Yeah, nice. What else? He's, he's looking for the rare. Right? One more? Anyone else? 
He has doubt? What do you mean by that? It's rare or not. Okay, so let's zoom out a little bit and remember this is Jesus speaking about the kingdom that is now in you and he's giving these reference points because the kingdom is so vast he can't put one definition, right? So he's giving all these examples. So it's Jesus saying it's like a treasure and now he's like it's like a, a, a merchant searching for fine pearls and then... Who goes, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold it the worms are told all he had and bought it. On finding one pearl. One pearl of great value. value. What does that say to you? So this is a man searching for fine pearls, finds one pearl of great value, sells everything he has for it. Found what he was looking for? Willing to let go of everything for that? Yep. But he's looking for fine pearls. Now he finds one pearl. Nothing else mattered? More than what he imagined? What else does that say to you? He's looking for fine pearls, but he finds one pearl of great price. It's unique. Great value. What else? A large pearl, yeah? It's a pearl of great price. What does that say to you? He settled for life. What else? What else? Two more answers. Searching for fine pearls, finds one pearl of great price. Sells everything he has for it. Knew the real value. That one pearl satisfied him. Do you think he had a bunch of pearls that he sold? For that pearl? Big one pearl more valuable than all the pearls that he had, right? He's a merchant. He's not a normal person. So he has stock. He has lots of pearls. And this one pearl was greater than all the pearls. And so Jesus does that one pearl would change his life. Yeah, set for life. So Jesus is giving this example of what it is like when you find the kingdom. And he goes, when somebody really sees the kingdom... Not when somebody answers an altar call. Not when somebody is a part of a group that decided to come up to the front and pledge something. He said, when someone really finds the kingdom, the automatic response is that in his joy, not in fear and drudgery, or someone has to keep telling them, or your life should change. No, no. In his joy. He actually found something. In his joy, he sells everything he has because he sees its value. Are you with me? How many of you think you found that pearl? How many of you are like, I saw that treasure? Be honest. Right? And when you saw it, in your joy, boom, the rest of the life, right? The rest of your old life was gone. How many of you feel like you found that treasure? Huh? Can we get some hands up? Yeah? Most people, some people not sure. Right? How many of you feel like that joy that you had to throw everything away and grab this pearl is the same as it was when you saw the kingdom? How many of you feel it's the same? A couple? How many of you feel like it's changed 50%? How many of you feel like you've been doing ministry for so long now, there is no joy? Safe space. To tell the truth. Congratulations. Okay. Good. Some of you are still not sure if you can be safe here. But you can. And so Jesus is demonstrating. Here's how you know someone found the kingdom. First thing that happens is joy. Joy. They don't need convincing. You don't have to tell them what they should do. You should not do. Automatically they're like I'm done with that. Are you with me? And so what happens is that. When we have not found the treasure. We have to now start talking about the treasure like we found it. And evangelism becomes me trying to sell a treasure to somebody I don't even have. It's hard work. Do you understand? If I have the treasure, I don't care if you want it. I'm enjoying it. But people are like, it's so hard for me to talk to people about Jesus. Because you're trying to sell something you don't enjoy. 
You go eat noodles at this new noodle place, you want to tell everybody. You go watch a movie, you want to post it on Facebook, tell everybody. Apparently, Jesus saved your life. It's hard to tell someone. Do you see a problem? I'm not bringing any condemnation on you. I'm speaking truth so you can actually be ready to see the treasure. Because once you see that treasure, it's game over. Are you with me? Okay, so then we go... I'm, I'm jumping here. So can somebody jump to Luke 5, 1 to 11? Luke 5, 1 to 11. All right, go for it. I'm going to get you to read. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when, he, and when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their parents in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus, as Jesus knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that had take, they had taken. And also and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Boom. So little Joseph Wilson version. Right? Jesus, all these people are following him because he's the light of the world. They're coming to the light. Jesus is not chasing people, telling them where they should come like a tugboat. They're seeing his light. They're coming like moths to a light. Are you with me? So they're pressing on him. Jesus says, okay, I need to preach to these guys. Peter, let me use your boat. I'm going to use your boat, go into the water, and my voice will be carried. My frequency will be carried by the water so the masses can hear me. So he preaches. Remember, Peter's listening to the sermon, same sermon, while he's fixing his nets. After he finishes, he says, Peter, go and cast your net. Uh, and Peter's like, oh, I've been doing it all night, but okay, I'll listen to you. He goes out, casts the net, catches so much fish. We kind of talked about it last night. And then he comes back into shore, and the catch causes him to fall on the ground. And he's like, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Right? And this realization hits him. What did Peter find? In that interaction, what did Peter find? The treasure. The treasure. Do you understand? Peter's fishing for what he thinks is treasure. Like a merchant looking for fine pearls. He's looking for a big catch of fish, which is cha-ching for him. And then he finds the cha-ching, but in that he sees a treasure that's better than his cha-ching. And what does Peter do? Falls on his knees and then what? Repents and then what? In his joy, he leaves everything behind and follows him. Sound familiar? Yeah. Kingdom of God, like treasure hidden in a field, a man finds. In his joy, sells everything he has. Boom. Catch you later. Okay, now we move further. Acts chapter 2, 3 to 11. Undivided, undivided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each oh, Two. Yeah. And rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to check my reference. <laughs> where is the story of Gate Beautiful? Anybody know? Oh, it's Acts chapter 3. Oh, there we go. Okay. 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. 
and the man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple they called, that is called the beautiful gates, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who was sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, okay. asking for arms. Asking for arms. Boom. Okay, so quick synopsis. Uh, Peter and John walking into the temple. At the gate, there's these beggars. Uh, if you've been to churches in India, some of the old Anglican Presbyterian churches, you would see that tradition still continue. I remember when I was a kid, there'd be a line of guys who had leprosy waiting at the gate, you know, because Christians are generous, right? So Peter and John are going, and they say that this guy is looking for something. What was he looking for? Arms. He's looking for money. Peter sees him, John sees him, and then Peter says, look at us. And what does he say after that? Silver, gold, have I none. But what I have, I give you. What did they have? The treasure. They had the treasure. And now the lame guy sees the treasure, gets totally healed. And his response in his joy, leaving, praising, singing, leave his old life gone. Are you seeing the pattern? Are you with me? Our job was just supposed to reveal the treasure. But we can't reveal the treasure that we haven't encountered ourselves. Are you getting what I'm saying here? And so God's inviting you into that encounter with that treasure. Some of you have never had it. Some of you have forgotten it. Some of you have forgotten that time where you encountered God and everything else just seemed so useless compared to what you just found. Are you, are you with me? Yeah. So I want you to just share with your partner where you're at. Maybe you're the forgotten. Maybe you're the never had. Maybe you're the still right in a good place. And we're just going to take one minute each and pray for one another, okay? So if someone has, if your partner hasn't had an encounter, you are now praying that they will have one. If they've forgotten, you're now praying that they will come back to their place. And if you're in a good place, then you're in a good place. Okay? Go for it. Thirty seconds. Oh, your plan is missing.
We'll go 15 more seconds. Okay, you want to wrap it up? Quick breaths, just for time purposes. Simple prayers, faithful prayers, don't have to be long prayers. Okay, you want to wrap that up? We're going to keep moving. Okay. So, now we go to Matthew 13, 33. And I want to show you how God designed for this treasure to be found. Through you. Okay, so can I can I get you to read that? Matthew thirteen thirty-three. You can read it from the screen as well. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like is like a leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of cloth till it was all leavened. Till it was all leavened. So he's giving this strategy on how the kingdom works in places where it hasn't been invited yet. Are you with me? So what can you tell me about yeast? It grows, it rises, yeah, but, but yeast doesn't rise on its own. So what can you tell me about yeast? Catalyst. Catalyst. It causes something to happen, yep. Like we talked about the definition of influence, causing something to happen. What else? Reaction, there's a reaction. Yep, what can you tell me about yeast? A very little is enough. Very little is enough. Jesus seems to be very convinced that if you want faith, you just need mustard seed. You want to change the world, just a little bit of leaven. Change the whole lump. He's very convinced. You don't need much, but what you have must be used. And so, we go in here, when you look at yeast, you start to see that size doesn't matter. There's a whole bunch of dough, a little bit of yeast, boom. That means one person in a company can change the whole culture of their company. That means you being present somewhere can cause prosperity to come there just because of you. The Bible says that where Joseph was working, his boss was blessed just because he was there. Are you with me? There's a story of uh, the Ark of the Covenant and how it ended up in Obed-Edom's house. You guys know that story? And when the Ark was in Obed-Edom's house, what happened? He was blessed. Where's the Ark now? In you. Which means you are what? Some of you not sure about this. Yeah. And when your soul starts to agree with what's happened in your spirit, you will start to see it in your body. Are you with me? And so this yeast, he's using such an interesting analogy. And so yeast doesn't impose. It's not coming like the big bully that's going to force its way into anything. Do you know a lot of people think that evangelism has to be like that. For people to see Jesus, you have to be like that. We think boldness has to look one way. Are you with me? And so yeast doesn't impose. It doesn't intimidate. It just quietly goes about its job. Yeast is not doing something. It is being it. Are you with me? Yeast is not trying to do something. It's just being yeast. And once it was added into dough, boom. So he's giving us this picture of how influence works. So when I see Dubai, I see this starting to happen in the next decade. Where people are going into influential positions, but they're not going there as a Christian and everybody needs to know and they become the token Christian in the company. But they're actually going there on kingdom assignment and allowing Father to take them where they need to be in an organization for a purpose that is bigger than their income. Do you understand? 
In Christianity, you go to work to earn money. In the kingdom, you go there because the kingdom has an agenda for that space. In Christianity, you have a business to earn money, earn a living, and then you give some of your money to the kingdom. But in the kingdom, you have a business because the business has an agenda in the city. Are you with me? Making sense? One person awake somewhere there. I love it. Okay, so we talked about what's influence. We talked about how kingdom influence is the effect that the king desires, not the effect that I desire. I could go to many places and have my own desire, but because I understand I have a king, I submit my desire to his. Does that make sense? So sometimes he'll keep you at a job that you don't want to be at, that you think you're ready to leave. But he knows whether you are or not. Do you get what I'm saying? I was at a job, I was ready to leave. I used to be a door-to-door salesman. That's where I learned how to move in the power of God. I would lay hands on the sick. My customers would buy cable TV, they'd get healed, and I'd get a sale and I'd go home happy, you know? But after about two and a half years, I was like, Lord, I'm ready to move. Where are we going? And he's like, nowhere. You know? And every month I'm like, where are we going? Nowhere. And it was another year and a half before I actually got released from that place. Because my desire was one thing, but his desire is another. Are you with me? And what happens as you mature is your desires start to collide. They start to mesh. They start to mix. And you stop having your own desires anymore. Because you're going back to your original intent, which is to be just like Him. Are you with me? Okay, so kingdom influence. So now we're going to quickly look at this. Because all of you have been appointed areas of influence. So first, the the most important person you are ever going to influence is who? Yourself. Yourself, integrity, being able to do what you said you were going to do long after the feeling with which you said it is gone. Are you with me? Integrity, influencing yourself. If I wake up in the morning and I know I need to go work out, but I can't talk myself into working out, what kind of influence will I have out there? If I know I need to show up somewhere because I told them I'm going to come, and now I'm in trouble and it's going to take me twice the time to go there, and I'm just like, well, I'm not just going to go, I'm, I'm not going to go anymore. What influence can I have out there if I can't influence myself? Are you with me? Where is the kingdom of God? Within you. And if you're not able to influence yourself in it, you won't have influence on the outside. Do you get what I'm saying? Like some of you, have you met people that are broke and then they try and give you money advice? Have you met people, their marriage is struggling, they want to tell you how to be a better husband. How are you going to give them influence? There's no influence there. Are, are you with me? The most important person to influence is yourself. Okay. Then you got your spouse, your husband, your wife. A lot of times, uh, doing all these marriage courses, I've seen that we want external accountability. We want to keep our spouse accountable higher than we want to be responsible. When I come into my marriage, if me being responsible is more important than her being accountable to me, everything is easy. But if in every issue, I'm looking to her issue instead of my problem, it's a hard road. Are you with me? And so your spouse, how much influence do you have with your spouse, your family, your friends? I'm trying not to go too long here, I guess I'm skipping a lot of stuff. All right? Then we got workplace, your employer, employees. Are you known as that, that crazy person at your workplace? I'm trying not to go there. Okay. So... Do you have influence at your workplace? Are you a person people want to walk away from? Because every time they come near you, it's some issue, it's some problem, right? Do you have influence? Your business, your clients, employees, even church and home group. Even church and home group. There's a lot of false influence that's given in churches and home groups. Like a lot of times, like because people have um, a title, they think that they should have influence in someone's life. Are you with me? But influence is not imposed, it's... Given, invited. Okay, so now with your partner, I want you to give yourself a score for each one of these out of 10. This is for yourself, you're not sharing with anyone else. Self-awareness, that's the first step. Jesus said, deny yourself and follow me. Most people don't even know the self to deny. So how are they going to follow them? Are you with me? So I want you to give yourself a score. 10 being you have great influence, and 1 being you're just now thinking about it, right? You've got none. Okay, so I want you to give yourself a score and then talk with your partner about that. Share, exchange, scores. You've got three minutes, okay?
my pocket. Sorry. Thirty seconds. If you're watching the recording, you can do this yourself at home. Five seconds. Okay, time. Just quickly, anybody shocked with the number as they thought about it? Did anybody get surprised with the number? No? You're all happy with your numbers? No, not very happy with your numbers. <laughs> Which one of these were you like, man, I really need to put some time into that? Just yell it out. Self? Whoa, 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 whoa. Self, 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 okay? Okay, there's a little bit of self-sabotage going on, okay. All right, and so now we come into two elements of you stepping into your kingdom assignment as you learn how to move and influence, as you understand every space God gets you into is to be light and salt and to be yeast. These two things are going to become a byproduct, right? And so a lot of times people talk about the Great Commission, but very rarely do we talk about the Great Commandment. Which one of these two actually is supposed to come first? What happens if you do the second without the first? No love? What happens? Damage? Poor results? Without direction? What happens when you try and make disciples of all nations and the first one is not in check? People get hurt. Control. All the things that some of us have seen a lot of. Are you with me? We think, I'll come here, get in the beautiful presence of God, right? Like AJ, I want AJ over there. He can take people into realms. So we come there and like, I love you, God. I hate this guy next to me, but I love you, Lord. I have such a problem with him, but I love you. And we think that God's okay with that. It's crazy. We think that God's not interested in our relationships with anyone as long as we know how to get into that space. Are you with me? That's a massive issue in the kingdom. It works in charismatic Pentecostal Christianity. But in the kingdom, that's not going to fly. And so, great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I'm about to challenge you a little bit, okay? See, in New Zealand, when it comes to moving in the things of God, people are really uh, stubborn. Because it's like, well, I can't do that because I have this set up. Um, I don't know if I'm willing to give up that. I don't know if I'm willing to walk away from that. 
Do you think that those people actually love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their might? And so I want to put this question to you right now. I'll get you to close your eyes. Right, and Holy Spirit's right here. God's right here. Let Him speak to you on this. I'm putting this question to you. And you want to ask the Lord, Lord, do I love you with all my heart? With all my soul? With all my mind? Let Him speak to you. And then ask Him this question, what is in the way? What is in the way? How many of you feel like you heard an answer? Just put your hand up. What was in the way? You don't have to share your answer, but you heard it. Right? Can you put your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Feel you. Great. Okay. Now you can take that home and do something about it. You can do something about it. Right? Don't go get someone else to pray about it. You have God. You don't need a mediator anymore. Are you with me? So you can go to Him and, and talk through it. Now, if you have something that's really hard to walk away from, He's such a good Father, you can tell Him that. Like, I know this is in the way, I don't know what to do. I know this is in the way, but this is too hard. I know this is in the way, but it's so painful, I don't know where to go. But, I am willing to give you permission to help me. Are you with me? In the Gospel of the Kingdom, the only thing He is asking you for is, are you willing? Not, are you capable? Are you great? Can you do it? No, 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 no. Are you willing? Because if you're willing, He does all the work. Are you with me? We're going back to maturity where you just receive. You don't earn it. You just receive. Okay? And so then the great, the great commission, therefore go and make disciples, all gets twisted when loving God with everything is not in place. Because now you start demanding behavior from each other. Now I don't have time to go into all of that, but great commandment first, great commission second, do you love God with everything? We just went through that. Another interesting thing is Jesus in John 13 before he's going to walk away from the disciples and go on that journey, he says, love one another as I have loved you. Right? He says, this new commandment I give you. So now he's up in the game. What do you think it means when he says, love one another as I have loved you? Unconditionally? What does it mean? Why is he saying, as I have loved you? Talking to the disciples. Benchmark? Selfless? How did he love the disciples? Freely received, freely gave? Yeah. How did he demonstrate love for the disciples? Are you asking me that question? Yeah. 100%. What was your name, sir? Andrew. Yeah, I met you before. Awesome. Yeah, Andrew. If I'm going to try and love like Him, I can't. But if I am going to give you the love He has given me, I can. See, this is the problem, is that we're trying to give our love to people, but actually we didn't even know what love was till He loved us first. So if you're going to say to me, do I have the ability? I said, no, you don't. Do you have access? Yes, 100%. So you will meet some people and you're like, it's so hard to love them. Father, I give you full permission to father me into loving them. And suddenly, something happens. And when someone says, how come you love like that? You're like, I don't even know. Yeah. Are you with me? You have full access to be just like Jesus because He died on the cross to pull you into that place. Yeah. yeah? So you totally can. So throw me some more answers. How did He love the disciples? Serving? Is it serving? Yeah, He served them. What else did He do for them? He forgave them? Yep. He trained them. Yeah. What else? He fed them. This is the part that some of us don't like. He funded their lifestyle for three and a half years. He didn't just say, come to ministry, take up your own offering. He's like, you're coming with me. I got you. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm going to feed you this whole time. What else did he do? We'll take two more answers. How did he love them? Showed them what? 
What love was? By doing what? Demonstrating what? Yeah, and so we're trying to see what love looks like. Because love looks like something. It's not just a word. Babies feel love, they can't understand any word. Are you with me? When you see a baby, you just fall in love with your baby. But there's no words exchanged. So we're trying to see, see, there's a reason he says, as I have loved you to the disciples. He's saying, everyone has a definition of love. The love I'm talking about is not that. Your definition of love, what you watched in Shah Rukh Khan, Bollywood movies, <laughs> then what your parents taught you, the books you read, that's not the love I'm talking about. The love is the three and a half years, what I did with you, that love. Are you with me? Alright, so another thing he did was he covered them. He protected them. He knew all of their issues. He didn't run around telling everybody how messed up they were. Do, do you understand? And he's like, I want you to love one another like that. We've not even thought about that. Because we're like, let's go do the Great Commission while I don't even love the people next to me right now. We come to church, oh man, service was great. Oh yeah, do you know Anna's struggling to pay her rent? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why Jesus is like, as I have loved you, I'll pay her rent. And if I can't, I'll find the money. Are you with me? See, we're like, oh, let's go and get the lost. And <laughs> we're all lost here. If love started to be the norm here, how many bees would come swarming in for this honey? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. So what we do is when revival comes, people feel the love. That's why they all come to a building. But you are supposed to be revival. Which means everywhere you go, there's so much love, people come to your building. You are the building. And you start having revival everywhere you go. But your ego, it's not going to get any stroking because nobody cares. Like you're not in front of the stage. You're just having revival everywhere you go. Okay, we keep moving. We keep moving. So, can anyone finish that sentence? We only love because... Hey, we're awake. Okay, good. And now here's my question. How good are you at receiving God's love? Are you, are you with me? Like, if I'm really receiving all of God's love, I can love anybody? Everywhere? At any time, no matter what they do to me, it's not my love. And so, when I'm training and coaching people, even business people, even people that are so high achievers, I train them in sitting in the love chair. A love chair. Sit on the chair, lean back, close your eyes, and shut your mouth. And let God love you. And they find it so hard. Well, I better pray something. Because if I don't pray, how is he going to know that I want his love? I better tell him what I want, because he apparently doesn't know anything. Do you see what I'm saying? I should pray in tongues at least for five minutes, because if I don't, how can I get the love? And suddenly all the religions start to show up, because they can't just sit and receive love. And usually what happens in the first week, they hear nothing. Because they're so used to performing for it, they won't let him speak. And at some point they give up, and suddenly they start hearing things like, I love you. And they're one line. Do you know, you can speak 10,000 lines to God and nothing changes. He speaks one line to you, game over. Whole life change. And so, what do you think we should be learning more? Speaking or listening? <laughs> and so we've turned prayer into this, this monologue. You know, it's like me calling you up and I'm like, hey, da, 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 da. okay, okay, bye. Hey, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. I want no relationship, but I just want the benefit. Give it to me, thank you, buddy. Yeah? Me start. And so, we're going to practice this for 30 seconds, okay? Ideally, I wanted to do it longer, but we're running out of time. But, some of you are going to get it. And some of you need to practice this at home, okay? So, recline back on your seat. Close your eyes. I want you to relax. One of the things to do to relax, take a deep breath in your nose. As you take a breath in your nose, fill your belly, not your chest. Some of you love to fill your chest. Fill your belly, okay? We're going to try it again. Don't worry, no one's looking at your belly. Let it loose. Let it go, okay? Deep breath in your nose. Fill that belly. And then breathe out nice and long. Tighten that belly. And then we go again. Deep breath. Fill the belly. And then. Alright, keep that breathing. Eyes closed. I'm just praying to you. Father, I thank you that you love every person in here so much. I want you to set your intention in your heart. Father, I receive your love right now. 
Just intention in your heart, I receive your love right now. Now some of you are going to see images like honey washing over you, or a waterfall, or trickles of rain. Some of you are going to see other things. Let them show you. Let them love you right now. Some of you, just breathe in that love. Let it go up your nose, in through your body. Total bliss. Now relax that body a little bit more. And see if you can turn your hands to where you're receiving. Instead of closing up, just for 10 more seconds, just receive. Open your palms like you're receiving a gift. Yeah. Nice and relax. And take three more deep breaths. Deep breath in. Fill the belly. Deep breath out. This time as you breathe in, imagine the glory of God going in your nose. Deep, let it go in there. And now as you breathe out, fill your body with that glory. All through your body. This time as you breathe in, let the glory go in. And this time as you breathe out, release it through your body, around you, into the atmosphere. Okay, boom. I'm going to get you out now. We've got to keep moving. See? See, there was like one minute. People go, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to seek God. That was one minute. You can do that when you wake up in the morning. I recommend it. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed, it's the best time. Because you're in this lucid state. You will, your soul will be quiet. And you will let God speak to you. But you know, when I have hard days, busy days, this is all I do. Two minutes. One minute. Go find a chair somewhere where no one is there. Go there and just... Oh, thank you, Lord. So let it all go. Sit in that love. Unconditional love. Two minutes. My whole day switches. What is my day switch? I switch. Are you with me? Are you guys okay? Yeah. Some of you fell asleep? Yeah. Don't lie to me. I was waiting for someone to go. <laughs> okay, so last couple of things, all right? So you have assignments. Uh, two days ago, we talked about assignments. If you haven't seen that, you should watch the recording. It'll come out next week. I talk about assignments, okay? So there's two types of assignments. There's overt assignments and covert assignments. In the overt assignment, everybody knows what you're up to. Okay, so some of you that are ministers, your pastors, your leaders, it's, everybody knows what you're up to. But most of you have a covert assignment. Do you understand that in the rest of the world, I don't know how much Dubai is open to the rest of the world, but there's this transgender agenda going on. You guys know about that, right? Like big LGBTQ, they got more letters now. All kinds of stuff is going on, but they're such a minority. They're like 1%, 1.3% of the population of the world. How come they are so loud? Do you know why they're loud? They've been busy working their COVID assignment. And they've gotten themselves into places where when they speak, there's all these loudspeakers. And all the Christians are just sitting in a building trying to change the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Most of you have a covert assignment. God didn't just put you in Dubai. You didn't come here accident. A lot of you got tricked. You thought you came here for money, security, retirement. And God's like, no, no, I brought you here because you carry something for the nation. And you're going to do something here and you're going to do something back in your homeland. A lot of Chinese, a lot of Indians have come to New Zealand. A lot of Hindus have come to New Zealand and encounter God. God and say, but they thought they're coming for university. If they stayed in their own country, they would have never met the Lord. Then they've gone back, all their families come over, and the family's getting saved, having encounters with the treasure. Are you with me? Yeah. So you guys have covert assignments. You might want to start taking time to go, oh, what's my assignment here? I was a personal trainer. I can't run around being like, oh, Jesus Fitness. <laughs> Do you understand? Like, I worked in a corporate space called Fuse Fit. It wasn't like, uh, in the introduction, it wasn't like a Joseph Wilson pastor to the gym. My logo wasn't a fish. You know how we like to put the fish? We have to, we have to let everybody know I'm a Christian. I was in there for a reason. And I started ministering to CEOs who have problems. They're so successful, making all the money, they need a bottle of wine every night just to sleep. Are, are you with me? 
And suddenly in there, people are having encounters. People that have a homosexual lifestyle are getting healed. And they, they have to deal with that, not me. It wasn't my job to convince them of anything. I just had to reveal the truth. And I've seen like the one lady, you know, in that kind of lifestyle, uh, her leg grew out. She runs around the gym just dropping F-bombs. Oh, yeah, what is that? Is that she saw the treasure. Are, are you with me? My job in that place wasn't to let everybody know I'm a Christian. It was to allow the kingdom to flow. Some of you guys have a lot of attacks. You have a lot of things, pressure come at you because you blew your cover. Are you, are you with me? So God's training you to keep your cover so that He can put you in a place. Like imagine if you're called to politics and you're going to be a prime minister. You're going to have to learn how to zip it. You're going to have to learn how to speak, when to speak, when not to speak. Flowing with the Lord. Are you with me? So a lot of us have not understood that covert assignments are more important. And a lot of the, the agenda like we talk about is happening covertly. Okay, so you've been divinely positioned to execute Great commandment. So before you try and get people saying, will you be loved? Because as you're being loved, influence will be invited. Are you with me? Okay. So a lot of us have learned how to be harmless as a dove, but we threw away the wise as a serpent. In this next decade, this is going to be very important. Now some of you have a combo of assignments. Because where you serve at your church, at your local body, you might be a pastor or a worship leader or something like that. But outside that building, you're not. So if you don't learn how to write songs that the unsaved can listen to and feel the spirit, you're going to lose them. So many people just create gospel albums while the whole world is waiting for someone to speak on true love without using Christianese. That's why they gravitate to Ed Sheeran's love song. Because everybody was designed for love, but we have no, no many believers can write about love, sing about love, without using Christianese. Are, are you with me? That's just one example. Covert assignment. Some of you have both. And it might be time for you to start going deep into, okay, Lord, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing in my life? Alright, so I'm nearly done, okay? Bringing the culture of heaven into everything you are doing. What are some things that mark the culture of heaven? Can you throw me five things? Rejoicing. Rejoicing so there's joy. Love. What else? Helping, so serving. Prayers. Prayers. Yeah. What's the culture of heaven? What does that look what does the culture of heaven look like in your workplace as you're working? Yeah, there's love. What? Harmony. Yeah. What else? Excellence. Excellence. What else? Peace. Peace. Yeah. Peace. Unity. Prosperity. Prosperity. Integrity. So there's so much more, we, you know, that you can think about later. And the seven spirits of God, right? So if you know in Isaiah chapter 2, I think it's chapter 2 or chapter 11, it talks about the seven spirits of God. You have access to these realms where you can come up with solutions that you didn't even know until you walked in the room. I'm going to give you a real life example, okay, of what happened here, right? I ended up at a school, I ended up at a school with a couple over here, uh, a few days ago, and they start asking me questions, I'm like, whoa, 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 the whole time, I'm like, Lord, I have no idea, and then I open my mouth, boom, 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 and my own mind is going, bro, that's a good answer, like, I'm more amazed at my answer to them than they were, and when I left that room, I'm like, thank you, Lord, Dude, do you understand? Like this, this, this is not yours to carry. He puts you in that place. He, the, he gets it done. Okay? But these seven spirits will change the game. Alright, so we talk about this. Identity, assignment, maturity. I'm going to end with this. Your identity is developed with your intimacy with God and your family. So you must be doing life with people. And by that, I don't mean going to a church. I mean doing life with people. Where you're able to share your struggles. You're able to tell the truth. You, uh, you have fights. You know, in all the small groups that we've started in New Zealand, there's a lot of tension. Because people come out of the mindset of, I don't need to be perfect. And then they're like, yeah, I have a problem with you. I don't like how you do this. And they're like, oh, I don't like how you do this. Yeah, that's part of beautiful relationship. They're beautifully messy. You don't have to be PC. Once you have a group that can be so real with each other, unstoppable. 
Are you with me? So even though you go to church, I recommend you should be meeting with three or four people. Not more than that, because you can't be real with so many people at one time. Right? And that's where you're going to grow your identity the most, in the context of relationship. And then the last thing, you want to go all into your assignment. Okay, so I'm just going to pray with you quickly. I'm going to wrap this up. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. We give you total glory and permission to lead us, to guide us, to take us where you're taking us. I just pray that you will reveal to every person in this room their current assignment. Whether it's COVID or Ovid or both, that you will start to reveal it to them, Lord. That they will know, Holy Spirit, that you will bear witness. And they will start to see your power move through them in these areas. Father, I pray you will show them if there's anything in the way, if you're calling them deeper, that they will see it. And even if they're scared, even if they don't know how to do it, they will trust you over themselves. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, bless you guys.